Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the California ISO, I'd like to welcome you to the 2021 Interconnection Process Enhancement Phase 2 Stakeholder Meeting to discuss the tariff revision. My name is Caitlin McGee, representing the Stakeholder Affairs Group here at the ISO, and I'll be facilitating today's meeting. Um, I'm also joined by Bill Weaver, Assistant General Counsel uh, focused on infrastructure and freight. As a reminder, the presentation and the agenda for this meeting can be found on the policy initiatives webpage under the Stay Informed tab. So before we get started today, I have a few housekeeping reminders. Um, this call is being recorded for informational and convenience purposes only. Any related transcriptions should not be reprinted without the ISO's permission. We will pause for questions throughout the presentation and ask that comments are kept professional and respectful. To ask a question, you can raise your hand by selecting the hand icon above the chat window in WebEx, or if you've joined via audio only, press pound two on your device. You may also send your question via chat to all panelists or myself. Um, and we ask that you please remember to state your name and affiliation before making your comment. If you need technical assistance during today's meeting, please feel free to send a chat to the event producer. And today's agenda is pretty light. Uh, our primary focus is going to be on the tariff revisions, uh, and Bill will be walking through that today. And then just a, a brief reminder of our um, stakeholder process here at the, the California ISO. Um, we did kick off the phase two of the interconnection process enhancements policy initiative in May 2022. We've had several stakeholder calls over the past few months. Uh, to develop the final proposal, and that was adopted by the board back in October um, of this year. And so with that, I'll hand it over to Bill Weaver to uh, walk us through the tariff revisions today. Uh, thanks, Caitlin. Um, yeah, I will share my screen and get started here. Just some housekeeping items at first. Um, I'll say initially, I certainly have no intention of going till 3.50. Hopefully we can be done at, a, uh, at an easy 2.30 here. Um, let's see. So as always, my, my, my philosophy with the chair for Visions is to give stakeholders everything they want. And so I think, you know, based on the three sets of comments we received from the six cities, the Large Scale, scale Solar Association and Valley Electric Association, um, all of their comments had, you know, just helpful, pretty straightforward clarifications. And um, I've um, I've either added what they said specifically, or um, or tried tried to achieve the same um, the same intent that they had through um, a, a similar clarification or revision. Um, based on the comments we received and the, le the level of iterative changes, um, it doesn't seem like we, it doesn't seem like it's warranted to have a, sec a second round of formal stakeholder comments and certainly not a second call. Um, so after this call, I will finalize you know, kind of the second set of tariff revisions and we will have that posted on the website. Um, we won't, you know, formally solicit comments or have another call, but if you have other changes, um, please feel free to just email me or call me, um, and I I'm happy to iterate on anything that you know, stakeholders think is critical um, or, that, or that is warranted right up until we file at FERC and can't change it if we want to. Um, I anticipate that we will be taking some or all of these tariff revisions to FERC um, Probably in the mid January, mid to late January timeframe. Um, none of these are, are very time critical. We want to make sure we have a chance to iterate with FERC staff beforehand and, and take care of those things that are critical at the beginning of the year. Um, and, and then get these filed. So I anticipate, um, yeah, probably mid, a mid January filing. So please feel free to reach out um, before then if you have further changes. 
But with that, um, we'll go ahead and proceed. Um, I think you're looking at the revisions here. We're, we're essentially looking at three and a half sets of tariff revisions, um, a very short set of revisions for the CAISO as affected system language on, on reimbursement and using the base case. Um, the more expansive TPD revisions on off taker and counterparty status and how that will work. And finally, the, um, the even more expansive um, new cost allocation procedures for local transmission facilities. I say a half because I've also put in some um, minor tariff, tariff clarifications, things that were outstanding from a previous quote unquote bucket filings, or also the, the revision we're looking at here, which was um, something we've talked about in the phase two papers, but also was really kind of coming from one of the phase one policy changes which was to drop the idea of verifying regulatory approval for power purchase agreements. As we said in phase one, we found that um, if anything, it was only producing, you know, kind of false negatives. Um, everyone was able to get uh, regulatory approval once they had a power purchase agreement, but sometimes it wasn't always on like the best timeline and we were, we were creating more problems than, than solving them. So, so we had gotten rid of that for the TPD, but hadn't clarified that we were going to get rid of it in the commercial viability criteria as well. We, we said as much in phase two, now we're getting rid of it. That's what you see here. Um, and so I think six cities that asked where this was coming from, I think we had spelled out that it was a, it was a phase one revision, but we clarified in phase two that we were going to also take it out for the commercial viability criteria. Um, I, Again, I, I know it's hard to follow on your screens as I go through this. Um, you can zoom in as needed, but also it'll be posted after. I'll try to go through it. Where you're going to see what I'm seeing on my screen is the initial set of tariff provisions that we posted and you've commented on. Those will be in blue. Any iterative changes that I made after those comments will be in red. And I've included some of my comments to myself to remind myself to talk about these. So these are all things you saw and posted. I um, I am just going to go through the iterative changes um, because it seems like we didn't get a lot of real substantive questions or, or issues. Um, but if you want to raise your hand or anything to talk about something, um, then then please go ahead and and um, you know the operator can stop me or whatnot. So um, here in some of the TPD revisions. <clears throat> Both, I, th I think a couple parties brought this up that we really wanted to clarify that we're talking about, you know, these new rewards in the TPD deliverability that nothing, that the new, these, these new requirements aren't starting until you get a new award next cycle, not in the cycle that's occurring right now. And so clarified that. Also added some clarified lang clarifying language just to make this a little more clear about the five year requirement, that it's, you know, five years or more. Um, same thing here, LSA had a good clarification that, you know, we're really talking about TPD under groups A and B because C and D don't have um, PPA requirements. Uh, another good clarification that was really, they might not lose all their TPD, so I changed the if to to the extent, that's a good change. Uh, I think six cities brought up this, that um, there are requirements in this section as well, and so didn't want to you know, run into a exclusion problem. And so just include the cross-reference. Again, this is going to be consistent with pretty much everything we see here where there's just very minor clarifications between what we had. And that was pretty consistent with the comments. Um, a couple of parties asked, and so, so now we're looking at, uh, I apologize, we're, we're going consecutively through the tariff revisions and therefore switching back and forth. Um, among the different policy changes, but I guess that's how it was posted and that's probably how your documents are. So I think that is the easiest way to go. Um, but now, now we're talking about the local transmission facility uh, policy. Someone asked why we're only seeing tariff revisions in the non-phase gerrying facility questions. And that's because the phase gerrying facility 
provisions incorporate these non-phase provisions by reference when it comes to talking about the reimbursement eligibility. If you look at the phase sections, all they really do is talk about phasing and they say, oh, and, and, the, and the money is going to work like it does for non-phase. So that's why we don't see in the GitApp or the GIA expansive care provisions for this. Um, it's just incorporated by reference. There was a comment here that local transmission facilities isn't defined in the tariff. It is, I'd say sometimes you always got to check because Appendix A, it's such a big document. It can, sometimes things just don't search well and also it's local transmission facility. So maybe if you're searching for the plural, you didn't find it, but it is defined already in the tariff as a facility under CAISO control that's, um, that is at a voltage below 200 kilovolts. Uh, and we don't propose to make any changes there. That would be a, a much more expansive policy change if we, if we were to do so. Again, so maybe we can yeah. pause here real quick. I see a hand up from uh, Susan Schneider. Mm -hmm. Yep, go ahead, Susan. Hi, sorry, I have to train my lunch here. Um, I didn't even know you were going to call on me. Um, okay, I just had um, just a real clear, uh, quick one on uh, 8.9.2. Um, where you talk about, we, we had made a quick suggestion about when you talk about the counterparty criterion, we had had added a suggestion saying, well, what I mean is to be above. Um, it, it was, the word counterparty is um, not really defined anywhere. And, and so, and, but you use counterparty criterion several times here. So we thought it was, it would be worthwhile to add that suggested, you know, counterparty criterion. And then we had a parentheses to be above um, just to make it yeah, clear. I, that's what you were talking about. I saw that, but I don't think that is, I, I'm not only talking about 2B. I mean, someone could meet the counterpri counterparty criteria through 2A as well. Uh, or say 2A um, or 2B or number two above. Um, I, anyway, you said, I, I just, it just seemed a little, it, it was a little unclear what you were talking about there. So, okay. If you think it's, okay. I know, that was just a suggestion, but yeah, maybe 2A two, two or B or just number two above or something like that. Okay, that's what you're saying. Let me, let me take, I gotta take my notes here and. Um, okay, understood. Did you have anything else in this section, Susan? Um, yeah, I was wondering the, the deposit being non-refundable. Um, I, 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 obviously there's a deposit there, but is it, is it, I didn't recall that it would be non-refundable if, um, if the party, you know, withdraws or, or changes anything at all, even if it downsizes or, or goes converts to energy only. I just didn't remember seeing that in phase two. Um, yes, I saw that comment. I checked. It is in the phase two papers on the top of page 18. 18. Um, okay, we'll go ahead and check then. Yeah. And I mean, if they downsized or whatnot. Yeah, I don't know. I just didn't recall it being that that expansive. It's certainly, certainly the idea was that like, I mean, obviously most of these are going to be withdrawals, right? Someone says, forget it and gets out of queue. Um, yeah. And that's pretty straightforward. And, and certainly our intent and the, the, the final proposal was, yeah, you know, you're going to lose that money. Um, the incentive being not, you know, the incentive being to avoid um, hoarding TPD. Yeah. Okay, um, anyway, if you just double check and make sure that's really what it's, it's it was really that expansive, that would be, that'd be helpful. That's all we're asking. Yeah, it's definitely there, but I, I might want to think about, I might want to think about how it worked for downsizing um, as infrequent as that is. So, yeah, okay. I'm there. Appreciate okay. it. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so turning back to Local transmission facilities defined. Um, let's see. Um, at, just, just clarified the verbiage here. That, uh, you know, per, per stakeholder comments. Um, there was also there was also a number of comments saying, well, you know, local transmission facilities could be anything. What we're really talking about are those costs that are authorized by FERC, you know, pursuant to a rate case, a settlement after a rate case, et cetera, that are in the local, that are actually in the transmission owner's revenue requirement. And 
Um, that is certainly the case. That, that is correct. We're not just talking about, you know, any old cause. And, and I think, you know, most well, most readers would, would understand that, or at least like the, those of us who have, you know, had the unfortunate lives to, to go through, you know, rate cases and, and work on CAISO TAC and the transmission revenue requirements. You know, we, we know it's you know, only those costs that have been approved finally through through a, a, a rate case. Um, and so for that reason, I didn't want to go in and add kind of authorized before each of these mentions, you know, on revenue requirements or whatnot, because I didn't want to give the impression that there are any other, like, that, that we're ever thinking about anything but authorized transmission revenue requirements, right? There is no, there is no non-authorized transmission revenue requirements in the CAISO tariff for, for, for the GitHub or even for TAC and the TRBAA, we're, we're only talking about once something has been finally approved through a rate case. Um, and that's, and that there are sections already kind of pointing that out in section 26 and um, section eight of, uh, sections eight and nine of appendix F. Um, and really, you know, the, the utilities only come to us at the end of their rate cases when everything has been approved and locked in and they, they come in and, and adjust their revenue requirements. Um, I'm also the lawyer for that process, so. Familiar, familiar with that. Um, okay, local transmission facilities. Again, the blue is what we already had. The red here looks like we made more changes than we did, but really uh, two, two different stakeholders kind of read this the same way and seeing their comments, I thought, oh, maybe that is a little ambiguous. So I changed the order just to make it a little more clear and then added some clarifying language as, as I think six cities and LSA both suggested. Um, so we want to make sure the way it's going to work is that you know, the CAISO and PTO will always evaluate the interconnection customers, local transmission facility, reimbursement eligibility for it specifically at the time we negotiate and execute the GIA. So that's always going to happen. They're going to look at what is in the transmission revenue requirements, what has been approved in other GIAs, where are you going to fall on the 15% threshold, how is that going to affect your reimbursement eligibility. Additionally, and this is where it got kind of confusing, <clears throat> is that if the interconnection customer later, so uh, well, let me back up. So, so once that's locked into the GIA, we were very clear in the policy that's locked in, it's not changing, um, regardless of what happens with the transmission revenue requirement itself. Um, but separately, if the interconnection comes in later and adds capacity, makes a modification, does something that adds new local transmission facilities. Well, you know, usually that's done through an amendment to the GIA. Now we would have a new process where we kind of reevaluate the eligibility. And, and yes, as, as stakeholders were pointing out, it, it would be just for those incremental local transmission facilities, right? We're not gonna, we don't, we don't reopen the old analysis um, just because someone is triggered. We're, like any, any secondary review would be limited to the, the new facilities or, or, the, or the change as it were. So hopefully I've cleared that up here. Uh, now that was the intent. Um, everything here, no, no real comments. I don't think we received any comments or edits on the CAISO's affected system language, which ended up being pretty simple to capture. Um, this is part of our half a change for cluster 14, we realized in going through cluster 14 that some of this language that was modeled off the normal cluster studies just doesn't work and we're simplifying it to give the latest date possible for interconnection customers to make their financial security postings and, uh, and not triggering it off the, the publication of the report. Um, that's, that's kind of outside the I process, but just a clarification I want to include in this filing. And so I included it in this set of tariff revision so everyone could see. Um, same thing here on the phase versus non phase for local transmission facilities. The GIA incorporates this section by reference. So this is the more critical section. Um, for any non reimbursed local transmission facilities, as we said in the policy papers, it's our normal practice, similar to the Reliability network upgrade cap that they would receive merchant transmission CRRs to the extent CRRs are created, um, which usually is an increase in 
transmission capacity. Um, I think six cities suggested dropping so that we didn't need to be that specific, and there were other sections in 14.3.2, so we did that. No, no real policy change there. Um, nothing here again on CAISO as an effective system. Now we're back to local transmission facilities. This is kind of where the real meat and potatoes are with Appendix F, and I don't think we got any questions or other um, edits here that I haven't addressed. And um, that is it for, let's see, for, for IPE Phase 2. Um, as I said before, if you have other edits, if something, things, something comes to you in the middle of the night, it does to me, feel free to just email me or call me, and I'm happy to discuss through it right up until we file. Um, so pause here to see if anyone has any other final questions or thoughts or areas they want to talk about. We do have a question in the chat from David Bethnick. Where is this document located? So um, the, we'll be posting this to the web page after the meeting. Yep. Yeah, the original is already posted. That's what stakeholders commented on. And then, yeah, we, we hold off on this to see how the call goes, see if there's any iterative changes we want. But I don't think anyone wants to think about this deep into the holidays, so we'll probably try to just get this up as quick as possible, and I'll, I'll take it as homework to think about any other um, changes based on this call. But um, if that's it, I say we call it a day. Wish everyone Merry Christmas. I think you know, we're in the, the third night of Hanukkah. Happy Hanukkah to anyone, and um, yeah, have a great holiday, everyone. All righty. Thank you, everyone, for joining. That concludes today's conference. Thank you for using event services. You may now disconnect.